Thank you, everyone. Uh, so the title of the talk is Who is the Boss? Uh, building your own Who is Dataset for Reconnaissance. Just real quickly about me, I'm a senior staff security researcher at Sprocket Security. Always want to thank you know, Sprocket for not just the opportunity to come out, uh, but to get to talk about this research project. It was a fairly small research project over the past, past year, but I think it had value, and I'm sort of interested how other people are approaching this problem. Uh, I've worked in offensive security since about 2008. Uh, it's my second time speaking at La besides Las Vegas. Uh, the last time was 2013, though, so it, it, it's, been a, it's been a minute. Uh, so on to the content, because I know we have 20 minutes. Um, I think most people in this room have probably registered a domain before. Uh, and when you're registering a domain, you're required to provide ownership contact information. So that's going to be first name, last name, address, phone number, fax number, uh, email address. I have a Namecheap screenshot there. Um, and as part of that process for most modern registrars, you're given the option of uh, applying uh, redaction or privacy to what you put in there. If you decline that and somebody does a who is lookup on the domain, they'll get back the ownership information and th that's by design. If you do apply the redaction for privacy or the privacy feature, uh, then if somebody does a who is lookup on the domain, they'll get back redacted for privacy for the fields and then usually there's a URL that you can fill out and get access to the information depending on the registrar. So it's very common practice for, uh, to use reverse who is as part of the reconnaissance process. So for example, if you go to your terminal right now, type in whoisbankofamerica.com, you'll get back the information about Bank of America. So as we said, name, address, phone number, email, that sort of thing. At the bottom, I've sort of boxed out the domain.administrator at bankofamerica.com. So for red teamers, pen testers in the room, I'm sure you've done it, it's very common to use a data broker service to do an API call with, or to the UI as what other domains have been registered by domain.administrator at bankofamerica.com or whoever we're doing reconnaissance on. And if you do that call through like Hoxie, you'll get back about 400,000 domains. And typically the process from here is you sort of filter out the domains and see what's valid. In the case of this domain, uh, Hoxie will also do historical lookups, so these could be domains that have been long gone but were at one point registered by this email address. But really the idea from here is that we can pull out other domains that are owned by the company in scope. So this is at least some subset of these domains are also owned by that company. So again, for the red teamers, I'm sure you have stories. I mean, I give an example in the past few months. Uh, we do what's called continuous pen testing, so it's on an assessment. Uh, there was an Apex domain provided by a customer, a single Apex domain, did reverse who is, found additional Apex domains. Uh, within one of those, so you do the full reconnaissance pipeline after that, so subdomain brute forcing, port scanning, identifying services. Found a JSON environment file with uh, Azure creds hard-coded by DevOps in this adjacent Apex domain, and that gave us the foothold into the environment through this other Apex domain. So. Pretty common process. I think many of you uh, have, have done this before. This is one of my favorite quotes on it uh, by Jason Haddock, so I'm sure many of you guys know him. I, I saw him walking around the con earlier. Um, and that is, for every new Apex domain we find, we 4x our chance of hacking the target, right? So we have a, we have a multiple, multiplicative effect by finding a new Apex domain. And sort of in my mind, it's like, it's almost like the branch of a tree, right? So we found one Apex domain, now I find another one and that whole pipeline goes off of subdomain brute forcing, port scanning, all of the things that go along with potentially gaining access just through this additional APEC domain that's found. So although there's some filtering that we need to do, some process that we need to go through, it's so worthwhile that we end up doing it because it increases our chances of potentially getting in. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some data brokers, uh, really common data brokers, there are many of them. These are three examples. Uh, Hoxie is super popular, uh, really reasonable API cost to do reverse lookups. You can also do regular lookups and bulk lookups. Lots of tools on GitHub to automate that process if that's what you want to do. Uh, Security Trails, another really popular one. They're more broadly focused on ASM, but within their documentation, they absolutely have reverse uh, who is lookups through the API. Uh, more expensive, but excellent data. And then who is XML API as well? I, I don't use them as much. Um, from what I understand, it's more, fo more focused on like OSINT or potentially malware domains, but again, very who is focused, lots of data. So that sort of lays the foundation, right? We've talked about uh, the importance of reverse who is, and now we're sort of moving more into the meat of the conversation, which is 
which started out with a research project of what if we managed our own Whois data set? So if we were like, all right, we're not necessarily going to use these data brokers for a bit. What does it sort of look like to manage our own Whois data set to aggregate and collect that data? And so the rest of the talk is really lessons learned building out that Whois recon data set that hopefully you can take with you if you want to try it out. Um, alerting on newly registered domains, which I would probably argue is the most valuable thing about managing your own Whois data set. And then some disadvantages that we just probably can't overcome, but are worth sort of discussing. Clock for a second. Okay, so uh, we're building out the recon data set for who is. The first thing we're going to do is source a lot of domains. I start with the Cisco umbrella top one million domains. One million domains is not a lot of domains, but what I really like about this data set is that it's it's valid, it's well organized. Um, and it's really good for like unit tests because as you build it out, uh, you can you can be pretty confident those domains are solid. Along the way, I tested a lot of different free domain sets, and I have to say this is probably by far the best. It's uh, TB Odan's domains project. Um, his goal is to have the largest set of free domains on the internet. So he has 1.3 billion domains available through GitHub right now. Um, you can bash script it as I did and pull out in, in the millions of Apex domains. I'd also say what's really nice about this domain set is it's organized by TLD. So if you want to focus on uh, .br, .brazil, or you want to focus on .bank because you're into the banking TLD, it's all organized and you can sort of go from there. The other one which is really important, and I would say the first two are like historic domains, right, because they depend on the last time they were updated. But we have this whole kind of problem with our data set where there's like 50,000 to 400,000 domains registered every 24 hours. So there's a lot of domains that are consistently being added and potentially on a continuous scale by, you know, one of our customers or whoever you're working with. Who is DS provides, who is DS.com, I should say, provides a newly registered domain set. So every 24 hours they put out a zip file, inside the zip file is a text with all the domains registered from the previous 24 hours. So it's really helpful if you're charting domains on a daily basis. Um, as part of this project, I wrote an open source tool called Who Is Watcher, and we're going to come back to this a couple different times. But in there, there's a flag dash dash nrd. If you put that on a cron tab, it'll just every day for say once a day, it'll download all the domains from the previous day. So you don't even need to go to the website; it'll just automatically do it for you. Okay, so we're trying to build our our data set. We have a large set of source domains. Now we need to begin to do who is lookups on them. Unfortunately, we can't just do that from like a residential IP or a home IP. There's IP rate limiting by certain registrars. There are certain reasons why you just wouldn't want to run it from home, essentially. Um, I'll talk about three different ways to do lookups. Uh, the first one is, is IPv6 proxying. So I actually, I, I didn't know about this technique till about a year ago. Um, but when you get a VPS and you enable IPv6 on it, they don't just give you like one single IPv6, it's not like IPv4. They give you a range of IPv6 addresses or a net block. So like DigitalOcean I think is like maybe 15, but if you go with a $5 Lino, they'll give you a slash, slash 64, which according to ChatGBT is sextillion million domains. Um, I just wrote thousands of millions because I wasn't really sure. It's a massive number of source IPv6 addresses that your single system can take on. So Black Lantern Security has a tool called Trevor Proxy, which sets up a local SOX proxy to rotate the source IPv6. So if you have that set up, then any request sent through that local so uh, SOX proxy will modify your source IPv6 and essentially rotate it as part of the process. Who is Watcher supports SOX proxying, so you can use it um, with this. Uh, it's an it's excellent tool, works very well. The one downside is not all registrars support IVB, I, IPv6. So what you're going to run into is certain subset of domains just can't be looked up with IPv6. You have to fall back to IPv4 uh, or another technique. Um, all right, second one. Who is lookups? So that's IPv6 proxying. Uh, you can, I've clocked it at about 100,000 to 200,000 domains uh, per 24 hours. Pretty good, but not the best. Um, next would be uh, RDAP. So um, there's, sort of, there's been, uh, like many protocols, there's a history to it. Who is goes back to the 1970s in a rap net. Um, Elizabeth Feinler's team, and she was like pivotal, and that she also helped develop DNS. 
They helped develop Who Is as part of RabNet. Um, originally, it was sort of like a white, pa uh, white pa uh, pages. Uh, and then in 2005, it was updated to uh, what we sort of look at as the current Who Is protocol. So that's on port 43. It's unencrypted. Um, it's human readable, not machine readable. Uh, and around 2017, started introducing RDAP, which is uh, a REST-based API for Who Is lookups. It will also return JSON. This sounds amazing, right? Like, oh wow, now we can just do HTTP, you know, REST-based lookups on domains and get JSON back. Unfortunately, uh, not all registrars support RDAP, um, and here's like the list of those that do and don't. And again, like IPv6, you end up having to fall back to a different technique to do mass lookups. Probably the most effective way I've seen do, uh, to do it is through serverless cloud. So again, I mentioned Who is Watcher. It's a small Go tool. You can easily deploy it into AWS Lambda. Um, so you can use like the AWS CDK, which makes it really easy to create a function and a function URL. Um, that was my preferred method for a long time. And then last month, I don't know if anybody saw the tool Lemma. Did anybody, has anybody heard of this tool? Really interesting, it allows you to deploy like uh, offensive tools into Lambda function URLs very, very easily and helps you uh, use them at scale. So it's an excellent tool. Um, Def Param is the author, if, uh, if you want to look it up. Um, and in there, there's a script called tools install tools.sh. You can add who is watcher into it, and then it'll automatically deploy into a function URL. So here's really the meat of this point. I probably could have started with this full bullet point, but if you're doing it through serverless cloud, 400 concurrent invocations, which isn't a lot, like most people's accounts allow for 1,000 concurrent invocations per, uh, per region. Um, but with 400 concurrent invocations, you'll complete 1 million to 1 and a half million uh, complete queries per 24 hours. So it's more than enough to do newly registered domains. Um, who is Watcher will also respect IP limitations. It has a built-in back off. So if it detects that the registrar is like, hey, you've made too many requests, it'll back off of it and stop the request. I'd also highly recommend uh, someone on the team uh, pointed this out. You can use AWS Event Bridge. So if you set AWS Event Bridge to run every minute and do like a modify of your Lambda function, so like almost doing nothing to it, but just modify it then the AWS infrastructure will redeploy it and so you receive a new source IP. So every minute you have a new source IP by doing a simple just modification through EventBridge. This is the command at the bottom here. So um, like cat domains, this could be, you know, the past 24 hours domains, piping a dilemma with 400 invocations, calling who is watcher and then saving the results. So pretty, pretty, uh, pretty painless way to do these mass lookups that need to be done. All right, so we have a set of source domains. We have a way to, uh, to look them up. Now we need sort of an application on top of that, unless you just want to take the domains and analyze them. Um, one of the best applications that I found is alerting on newly registered domains. So if you're doing like red teaming, continuous pen testing, bug bounty hunting, then as these, tw these uh, domains come out every 24 hours, you may want to be notified that a domain created was by a customer that you're following along with. So if we go back to that Bank of America example, and we have a registrant email of domain.administrator Bank of America, we can create a YAML file, and we just call, I called it watch list here. It has a key of email. If the email contains Bank of America, then I want to be alerted. So we're taking that lemma function or however you've saved all the domains. We set a watch list so we get notified if any of those domains are of interest, and then immediately we get updated so we know, hey, you know, something of interest just got registered within the past 24 hours. Let's kick off the reconnaissance process from there. Another big advantage, I would say, um, so with the data brokers, your reverse lookups are usually uh, scoped down to email, company name, um, and actually organization. So it's, it's email and organization, uh, and then domain name. But when we run the data, when we own the pipeline, we can do multiple. We can do reverse lookups on multiple points at once. So on the left here, we have Tesla.com. They've redacted everything, but they have a registrant organization of DNS to nation. Um, and one thing I think you've probably seen if you're into reconnaissance is companies tend to use the same registrar for all of their domains, and it kind of makes sense, right? You wouldn't want to register half your domains with, with Route 53 with AWS and uh, you know, half with Namecheap or something. 
So they tend to use the same registrar. So we can use a, a combination watch list. So we have our combo of domain contains Tesla and registrar contains their registrar. Uh, and then we'll get alerted on other domains that are their potentials. They're going to require a little bit of work, but they fit into that 1% you know, grouping that takes us over the line to maybe find a really impactful finding. So these were two example domains like I ran through like a large data set. I'm not sure if Tesla actually owns uh, teslaunionfree.com, but it does match up with the name along with the registrar. And obviously you can combo on other points too. You could do zip code, address, right? You can do different ones. Um, I can think of an assessment from the past six months where I identified a domain. It had a very specific name to one of our customers and then it had a registrar of AWS. And that led to like, a, it wasn't a big finding, but it was like a WordPress site that had just been sort of stood up and forgotten about a little bit. So the technique definitely works. It has a bit of a high noise uh, value, as you might guess, um, but it's absolutely effective. And especially when you have the pipeline in place, I mean, it's easy. Big disadvantages I would definitely call out. Um, number one is the data brokers have historic who has records going back well over 10 years. I think I saw 2007. For one of them, I wasn't sure which one it was. Um, and that's a really big advantage because if we think of like a company, like let's say we're doing Tesla and they've redacted, there might be a point in the past where they didn't redact that information, where that email was available, and then they can cross-reference on other historic emails and find other domains. So data brokers definitely have the advantage there. Um, on the upside, you know, it may be a limited number of API keys that we're burning in order to make calls on historic data. Um, but the, you know, overall, like, they do have excellent data. Second disadvantage I would call out is uh, buy versus build, um, which, you know, comes into play with all of this sort of stuff. Uh, the data brokers will sell most of this data wholesale. So if you were like, I want every uh, historic record for 550 million domains, you can buy that from um, some of the brokers that I talked about. It's quite expensive, but you can buy it. Um, you can also get it as a service, obviously, APIs or the UIs. Uh, who has DS in particular, if you wanted to do newly registered domains, you could pay to have their service of every single day instead of just the domains. I would like all of the results from who is. Uh, but again, you'd find the pricing on the website. It, it's not necessarily cheap. Um, second, this one maybe is a wash, but you do need to manage and curate your own data. So as you're building this out, you have to make sure, uh, you know, have I been IP rate limited on certain domains? Do I need to recheck them? Um, so it's really important to sort of manage your data. But again, you also get a really good glimpse into how the data looks. I mean, I have seen from the data brokers cases where they are IP restricted in some cases, and we'll have better data in our own data set. So there is definitely high value. In terms of the size of the data, it can like easily fit into ClickHouse, PostgreSQL. It's not a ton. Um, one thing I'd also call, about, call out about who is Watcher is rather than being like human readable, it'll give you JSON. So you can get all of your domains in JSON and then stick it in like ClickHouse and then immediately, you know, the columns are made out for you and you can analyze the data that way if you want. So I guess in closing, a um, couple takeaway resources. This isn't online yet. <laughs> I'll, I've, I, did, I was a little sketched out by the, uh, the Wi-Fi, so I didn't post it yet. Um, so it's a private repo, but it'll, it'll be up tonight. Um, and it's basically, as this research has gone on, just taking notes about uh, um, like blog posts and interesting things I've seen from who is a lot of really uh, interesting work that's been done over time. So it's cool to see that. And I put that in there. Um, certainly if you're into internet scale scanning, I would love to talk to you. Like I find this stuff super fascinating and coordinating it, scaling it, uh, thinking about it. So please come talk to me. I mean, that's part of the B sides mantra. Uh, and then that's all I had. So um, I don't know if there's any questions or, uh, Question from it. Yeah. So are you picking on Bank of America because they're on the other side of the wall? Are they a sponsor? Oh, my, my, my bad. No, no, I did not do that. I, I have noticed a little bit the banking domains. I don't know if they have a legal requirement to expose who is, excuse me, who is data, but that could be a part of it. But yes, I absolutely was picking on them. No. <laughs> um, for the uh, collection of uh, list of domains. Uh, ICANN has a uh, centralized zone data service, which uh, allows you to sign up and just get a zone file for every TLD. Uh, and it's updated daily. Did you try using that as a source for domains? So here's where it got a little bit 
off the camera, but um, is that a researcher required? Uh, it's it doesn't need to be researched. They they say it's available for uh, research, education, uh, um, security, law enforcement. Okay. Any, anybody can sign up. I have an account for it, and uh, it, they just provide you with an FTP, and you can download the zone files for every TLD uh, daily. And it's, is it? And it's, so it's the newly registered domain. Sorry, the newly registered domain. No, it's TLD. every domain registered under okay. the TLD. It'll, That's what I thought. Yeah, it'll give you every every domain registered under the TLD, uh, along with the name server, I believe. Okay. Yeah, because I, I looked into it a little bit, and I wasn't I wasn't sure about the terms of service. That's the only reason. That was my hesitation. But that, if, if every did anybody uh, need me to repeat that? Uh, if you want to just re repeat that really quick, because it's valuable. What the? Uh, where to sign up and get? Oh the yeah, you can go to ICANN. It's uh, the it's called the Centralized Zone Data Service, but you can sign up there. Um, you have to like provide information, and you're right. There is a terms of service. I think it, they just say you can't use that information for commercial purposes, which is kind of fuzzy. So you know. Yeah. You can, as I guess, as long as you're not selling it, I think it's probably fine. But you know, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> no lawyer. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank yep. you. An, oh. Another uh, non-question in a similar vein. Uh, there's also Open Intel, which uses um, um, the um, certificate transparency P certificates in a log to see what certificates were issued. And they provide data sets of domains that are in uh, CCTLDs, so domains that are not, don't have the ICANN uh, contract which forces them to publish the data. And I think they also have a Kafka stream of re recently registered domains. So it may also be very interesting to explore. And for everybody who's into this topic, it may be a very interesting resource. Cool. What was the name of the resource again? I'm sorry. Uh, Open Intel. Oh, Open Intel. OK, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the transparency log stuff can get super interesting as well. So what percentage do you think um, of your DNS lookups and stuff are you getting missed because of, per se, like a vendor uses um, a third-party hosting provider that then gets uh, all that stuff registered underneath them, but it's actually managed by that main party. So how much do you feel like you are missing out by misdirection of this project was, was stood up by a third-party vendor and all the DNS records are pointing towards that third party vendor instead of the main vendor that contracted that. So we're talking about like a Squarespace or yeah, like an example yeah. of, yeah. Um, that's a really good point. Uh, what, what I like about the data is we can sort of slice and dice it a little bit more. So I, I, my, the first thing that comes to mind is like two data points probably. Like, so we're taking Squarespace plus some other piece of information, maybe we can derive a little more, but percentage wise, I'm not sure about, um, not sure about how much we're missing there. Thanks. We're on break for about an hour, uh, and uh, we'll see you back here uh, after that. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.